Hi, everyone. So let's um, start our afternoon session with the second lecture of Professor Philip Walter on measurement-based quantum computing. Please. Hello, so welcome back after the nice lunch break. Um, I have the pleasure to talk again um, from the experimental point of view about uh, photonic quantum computing with today's emphasis on, on measurement-based quantum computing. And some of we have not properly arranged because it would have been good if Ernesto would have started with, his, um, with preparing the theory background in measurement-based quantum computing. So I, um, I will therefore basically still keep it rather simple and, and just give the basic ideas and then later on the full-fledged nice theory explanation and, and, and derivations and all of that will come from Ernesto. So um, what's the task of today? Today it's my pleasure to hopefully entertain you with um, some interesting uh, basic experiments done along this line. But first of all, I was asked yesterday that I should, should mention some kind of literature background where people can look up the things I mentioned about gates and so on. Um, these are my favorite um, handouts or lecture notes, both from Peter Koch, who um, basically has done a couple of years nice, nice uh, handouts covering um, basic ideas of how photonic quantum computing works, about KLM scheme, measurement-based scheme. So if you're interested, I think this is the most uh, accessible starting point. And if you get more interested into more deeper details, then of course you find other literature, which is anyways referenced in this one. So that's the easiest part to start with. If you, get li if you would like to get a full, um, full picture, then there's this review in modern physics, also like um, already eight years ago, which still covers uh, the a broad sense all of the photonic quantum computing aspects and I think it's a good point to start with if, you, if you're interested in understanding more. So today um, I will cover the one-way quantum computing from how experimentalists tend to present this kind of concept. Uh, we will also show we can implement gates with photons. Then based on that um, I will spend some time on something that I think is the, for me the most exciting uh, among the one of the most exciting directions in quantum computing, that security issues that can be done uh, by understanding how one-way quantum computing uh, works, and I will focus here a little bit on that, also with experiments, and then based on this concept, so it's like a like step by step a pyramid. Uh, I will hopefully give you also an, an idea how this nice toolbox of security allows you to verify quantum computers, which is one of the main tasks. Uh, for computer scientists to get control of this big beast, this quantum machine, uh, keeping in mind that they have only classical resources in your hand. Okay, let's start. So people have in mind to talk about quantum computing. Um, you know, there are different ways and models to do it, topological, adiabatic, and so on. But the standard thing you, you normally find on textbooks on page one is the so-called circuit model, where you start with your initial states. Um, yesterday we heard very nicely the concept and the framework where you have uh, unitaries here on single qubits, which basically should allow you to go to any point on this Bloch sphere. Uh, for example, they have to be like irrational to reach with many loops to the right, the right point. Um, then we need two qubit gates, which are like C naught, C phases that uh, basically can build up entanglement or read it out. And sometimes you have measurements in here. If you be like a photonic system, where you need those measurements to maybe uh, drive the gates. And then at the end, you have in the computational basis, and that's very important, as yesterday pointed out, the readout of your, of your system. And as you see, the things that you need basically is these unitaries covering arbitrary rotations. That's my definition, but you can also phrase this as you need XYZ power operators plus this pi over 8 gate. But for me, it's more like easier to say arbitrary rotations. And you need this two qubit gate, as shown here, to make everything that you need, everything that you want for your quantum computer to be universal. On the other hand, um, there, are others, there are other ways to do it, and the thing that we will talk today is this one-way or measurement-based quantum computing. Normally those definitions, one-way and measurement-based, are for the general theoretician the same, okay? If you be a photonic guy, you, 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 you somewhat distinguish because measurement-based is everything for you if you implement those gates. But in principle, from a the theoretical point of view, there's, there's a synonym, one-way or measurement-based quantum computing um, methods. So how does it work? So in contrast to the previous case, we have these circuits of one qubit and two qubit gates. You start now with a highly entangled resource. So this basically defines a qubit, the blue line, the blue point, 
and these lines means they're entangled. So you have this highly entangled resource where you now make measurements that drive your computation until you reach the end, and then you can do the readout. It's called one-way, and we go many times through this, through, this, through this idea. It's called one-way because once you measure the qubit, the entanglement is gone and the qubit is gone, so you cannot go back. That's in contrast to this scheme, where in principle you could start here and go also in that way, you know? It's, it's unitary transformation, it's linearity, so you can go back and forth. It's not the case here because once you measure the qubits, they're dead, gone, and basically you, you reached here by using the resources uh, that have been pre-existing there. Um, these are just like some wrap-ups which we hopefully learn through the course today. Um, for optics, it's particularly feasible because measurements are hardwired in photonic systems. Um, and here, as mentioned yesterday, with this kind of concept resources that you can put offline before you start your computation, you can see it as a resource that you, that you prepare offline somewhere with some other capabilities, and then once you have it, you make the measurements, you make the computations in a rather simple way, because measurements are cheap in terms of technological uh, resources. Um, and I mentioned later on, you also have errors to handle with. Now I mean just regular errors from the computation itself, not like errors like the coherence, that's a different issue, but those require that you need some classical communication that it cannot be faster than speed of light, basically, in, in, in sending information. So the story goes back to uh, Robert Rausendorf, German guy, and Hans Briegel, German Austrian guy, who basically in 2001 uh, had this very nice paper called One Way Quantum Computer, where in the abstract they basically explain everything that's in there. So they say, look, uh, we present a totally new scheme that basically has just one qubit measurements. That's different. Until that, it was like teleportation schemes which require belt state measurements, always two qubit or entangled measurements, and so on. And here it was really like one qubit measurements on a particular class of states, resources, the cluster states, and they said, well, the measurements basically define what kind of circuit you're going to implement. And here the measurements actually form the program. That's, a, that's basically a, a drawing we did many years ago. That was my impression when I was, was doing my PhD, when, when this came out, where I thought, it's like a typing machine. You know? The band comes through with the qubits, and you zack, measure, and then the qubit is defined and dead, and here would be the, the resource. Here comes the the output, so it's more like the Turing. I thought that time it was related to Turing machines. It was not, but uh, not, not in a sense what people have in mind, um, or the cellular automata, but that's a different story. Okay, so the way to understand this, how this computation works, there are many, many, many approaches. So I choose in particular this one as an estimate covered probably from a more uh, theoretical side. The easiest way for me to understand is to see how the resource state looks like. So you start basically the preparation of your resource, and you start by, taking cub by preparing qubits in the superposition state 0 plus 1. You see it? You place them here. They're not entangled yet. They're just regular uh, unentangled states. Then you turn on some interaction, okay? And the interaction here is a C phase or controlled set gate where if the both neighbored qubits, J and J1, are in the 1 state, they get this minus 1 phase shift, okay? So you apply this. That's basically the, the drawing for such a C phase gate between J and J1. So you apply this. Um, operation, and what's going to happen is that you basically each of the neighbors get this bond, which indicates now you have this uh, entangled state, which actually is the hard thing to do. And people try, basically, when this came out, to figure, figure out are there any schemes based on atoms, uh, optical lattices, and so on, to cool down something to a ground state, where this might be the ground state that, that, that's there for free. Unfortunately, cluster states are not a particular ground state. However, since it's now 10 years ago, there are many theoretical investigations. You find different states, like something with, which has not qubits, but qutrits, free level systems, which allow to have these AKLT states that can be reached via ground states uh, cooling. But whatever, that's just ideas how you can cool down um, interesting atoms, atomic systems to get them for free. Otherwise, you have to build gates and to basically apply each uh, gate between each of the qubits to get your state. So that's um, the formalism, you start with this um, n, n, the big number of qubits, you apply this basically Ising interaction, basically a phase gate is nothing else than an Ising interaction between neighbored qubits, and once you have the cluster state, you can characterize it by, um, by having a property that this kind of states, when you measure them, like a vortex in a Z basis, for like in this diamond configuration, with an X in the middle, it gives you a plus one eigenvalue. So that's basically a signature of cluster states that they really, which can be used in, in many purposes for characterization, but also for error modelings and so on, 
which we will not cover today, but that's the signature of the cluster states. Um, you can basically shape your cluster states if you want to say, well, you don't need all of the qubits. You can say, let's knock them out without destroying the neighbor entanglement. You see the black ones are qubits which have been measured in a so-called set basis or, or HV basis for photons. They are just knocked out without destroying the neighbor bonds, and there you can shape your, shape your cluster. You might ask, why do you would like to shape such a system? The answer is pretty simple. The shape defines the program, the software. So now by keeping in mind that we define, from, we go from left to right, then you see that basically here, the white ones are still the carriers of your information in principle. And by measuring one by one, okay, not I'm too far, measuring one by one, you go through the circuit. And the thing that's important, you see those lines, which are like uh, vertically uh, in the system, they basically, are effective uh, two-qubit entangling gates. So the point is here you see you get for free this kind of entangling resource between neighbored qubits because it's already pre-existing in your cluster state. And by that, basically, you can shape a circuit, which means one qubit is somewhat prepared or um, manipulated. Then basically, you have this kind of bond to the neighbored, neighbored qubit line here where you can implement C0, C phase gates, and so on. And the measurements, step-by-step, -step process your information until you reach the the final point there where you can read out your whatever result of a Grobers or Deutsch Joe's or whatever you would like to do. Okay, um, that's the cartoon of how cluster state computation works. Um, let's go basically step by step how it looks like in real life in a study of small systems where you can implement those in the, in the laboratory. So a C phase gate um, applied between those two qubits gives you the smallest case of a cluster state. So what's the answer, the question to you, what kind of state do you get if you apply C phase gate here? Come on guys, it's like, it's not even course one, it's course zero of, very good. Okay. But it looks like in that kind of, so normalization is not written down, but it looks like in this kind of weird basis. You see the second qubit has this kind of Hadamard operation intrinsically carrying, so it's not 0, zero 1, 1, it's 0 plus 1 minus. That's because of the C phase uh, properties. Keep in mind, C phase is the same as a C naught if you have two Hadamards, so somewhere you must have the difference also in the state preparation. Okay, what happens if you have three qubits and you apply not two C phases between them among the qubits, what do you get then? Very good. Cheat seized it. Precisely. So, what happens if you have four? It doesn't go until 20, just <laughs> it's the last. <laughs> it's the last line. So, which class is that? Sorry? No, I'm asking you. So, it's, it's a linear one. Is it GHC or not? It's not. So he basically is the first, the first, first kind of entanglement state that's different to a GHC class. However, it would be a GHC if the last one is not connected in this way, but rather like here. All stars are like GHC, but there's a star, one in the middle and then the neighbors. But this guy is already different, a different kind of class than a GHC state. So it means cluster states are different. There's some kind of properties as well. They're more robust than GHCs typically. Um, but here you see the first interesting candidate. Um, as I said, they merge from basic and nearest neighbor interactions. That's how you write it down in literature, um, where you apply this uh, C phase gate. And of course, the interesting thing is to find, to find situations where you can uh, naturally get clusters in every dimension. Of course, that was one dimensional, but it's interesting to go to more dimensions. As I've shown, you need two dimensions to have those effective C naught C phase gates implemented. And here, basically, we're applying between all of the neighbors the C phases. You see you get clusters here in two dimensions, but you can also imagine three dimensions and so on. That's basically your, your creativity is the limit of what you would like to do with such a resource state. Um, so how does the computation work? So let's go step by step what's happening when you have your cluster state and you entangle and then you, and then you make the measurements. So we define we go always from left to right. That's basically by all, by all kind of standards the way how it goes. So you start in this kind of rather boring situation where there's no entanglement established yet. So that's your input state, can be plus or any other favorite guy that you have in mind. Then you say, okay, now let's entangle. That's the hard job. And in principle, it's as hard as performing the computation in others with circuits, but uh, I will show later some interesting analogy to that. So basically, and, and apply the entangling operations, and by that you encode your input state here somehow 
into that physical qubits, okay? Because entanglement, you know, you mean you have this uh, non-local properties showing up. And what you do then, you start the measurement here. Boom. And what, what happens basically, so we go stepwise, so we have the mathematics later on. So basically you map your state from here to there with some kind of unitary operation. And you can do it again. So when you make a measurement here, you move it over there. When you have a measurement here, basically you move it over there until you reach the last, the last position there. We have now your output state, which is somewhat different than your original input state over there. And of course, those have been measured, so they're basically gone. That's the reason why they're really one way. Um, I will mention briefly how you can basically phrase such cluster computation in terms of circuits, okay? So um, the easiest way to understand what happens with two qubits when you say, okay, let's, let's use this kind of one teleportation gate that's happening when you, when you basically measure, make measurements to one of the qubits. Um, maybe I should start with some. So what, 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 so what you aim to do is we start with this kind of input state here which can be plus state or anything else, as shown before. And then you apply this C phase gate, which makes this two qubit cluster state. So now the question comes, can we understand what's happening when we make a measurement to the first guy? And basically that's shown here. What happened is, intrinsically by this kind of structure of the cluster states, you can rotate the first guy, or you can apply this Hadamard operation to turn it back to the computational basis. And when you make a measurement here, then depending on the outcome, you get a zero or one, that's pure random. Depending on what you get here, you can recover your input state by basically keeping in mind that this Hadamard here shows up again. And I'll show that in, in, in a second how it goes on the board. Plus, depending on the result is zero and one, did you get some Pauli correction here at the end, okay? So that's called basically a teleportation gate because you just teleport your system without any big changes through, through these wires here, okay? So to show you what I have in mind, that is really true what's just showing here, some little mathematics. So basically what we do is we start with some kind of um, psi in. We define as something like alpha plus beta one, okay? So now we basically here take this guy and have now the other qubit here's resource state and apply the CZ. Then what you get basically is um, alpha zero, zero plus alpha zero one plus beta one zero. Nothing happens there. But now since it's a C biscuit that we apply one here and the one there, so I didn't, didn't write it down. The plus state is nothing else. Then zero plus one. So the one guy here and the one guy there gets the minus phase shift and you get something like this. Okay? That's basically the state after you, after you started there. So What's, what's interesting now to rewrite what's happening, so basically we can rewrite this state as, um, as, um, as zero, no, it's easier to make it a plus. As zero times, zero is here. No, actually I prefer it the other way, it's easier for me. Zero and plus, plus, and then we take beta, it's beta one minus, okay? So it's basically the state that we get there. Um, what we like to do now is we apply a Hadamard um, on the first guy. So what's happening here? is um, keep in mind that we I just want to do something else. I'm stuck in here because I had something more interesting in mind. If it's my notes. OK. 
here now. It's like that. So we planted a Hada Mart here on the on the side. What happened is the first guys flipped to zero plus plus here. The second guy is just beta minus minus. Okay. If I now project here on the on the on the computational basis zero and one, then we should remember that zero basically is nothing else than one squared zero plus one and minus is nothing else than one squared. Can you read my handwriting? Sorry, it's like um, zero minus one. So we can rephrase this now as basically alpha zero plus one and keep the normalizations away. Zero plus one here, plus there, plus beta zero minus one. I'm not sure if I can see if I stand like this. Minus one and here minus qubit. So that's zero plus one is just basically re rewriting this guy. Plus is the same. This basically can rewrite the minus as zero minus one and the minus. If you project now on one or on zero, so basically gonna make the measurements. Then what you get? Basically here on the zero guy you get zero, for example, when you project on a zero, that means zero times um let's see, zero times you get alpha plus and here you get beta minus plus beta minus, okay? And if you get a one state, then you get alpha plus minus beta minus. Okay? And this here is nothing else than psi zero here. This one just is the rotated you know, input state. We had alpha plus beta in a rotated basis. So it's just like x operation applied to psi in. And the other one, one, is basically see x plus some kind of, uh, sorry, not x, Hadamard, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> Hadamard, yes, you're right, Hadamard. And for this guy, you see it's an x operation and the Hadamard on the psi in. Okay. So we can read my handwriting. But the story is uh, pretty straightforward that you can see um, such a circuit really allows you to recover the input state just by, in case of you have one outcome there, apply um, an X Pauli correction, which you find all the time. You remember like teleportation schemes, you also have this kind of, you get a result depending on what you get there, you have to apply this X, Y, or Z operation, which is the, the, the slow down for you that it cannot be faster than speed of light. Otherwise you could uh, run through basically at no time. Okay, then I got stuck here because actually I would like to, wanted to do the math for this one with the set rotation. Um, now I use it basically by hand to explain what's happening there. The nice property about cluster states is they have this C phase connections. And C phase gate is nice because when I write it down, it's just this matrix with 1, 1, 1, minus 1. It's diagonal, okay? Which means it allows to propagate through single queued, oper single queued operations because of this diagonal form of the matrix. And it's a partic particular signature such that you could write, you rotate the state here by some set rotation, or you could write the set rotations on this side because it really can be shifted through the circuit by, the, by its own design. So the, the point is now, you know, just add a rotation that R set means you rotate around the set axis of your block sphere by some angle alpha. When you apply the set rotation, then you still get out your, your output state here, but now you have this additional set rotation on top of it, okay? I could ask, why is this interesting? But in principle, it allows you to, instead of rotate here, to change the measurement basis, and I'll show in a second what I mean by that, to effectively rotate your guy as you want to. So you can really choose a basis where the set component is mapped into here, or actually both can be mapped into the measurement here, 
because nobody tells you you need to measure in the computation set basis. If you choose a different one, you really rotate your state according to what you've chosen as basis, and the basis defines the angle alpha. And then you have this rotation followed by this Hadamard. You can't get rid of the Hadamard. That's basically the trade-off for your, for your C-phase case because you have this, um, this style of the cluster states as shown before. And then there's this parallel correction which is needed to, to, allow, to, to allow it to be basically not faster than speed of light. Okay, but I just said in words. So what you can do is you can put those things in a new basis which defined by the Hadamard puts you into the zero plus one basis. So this is zero, would be basically zero and one. But Sorry. So by adding, by adding this Hadamard, you go to this zero plus one basis, and by adding the rotation here, you choose the basis by this phase there. Okay. So this basis defined by the x y plane on the Bloch sphere. So then, once you make a measurement here, you get this output state again zero. Nothing happens. One. You have to add these Pauli corrections at the end. So. Experimentalists like to draw circuits, so we have in mind with uh, our circuits are like basically like these kind of sticks and balls together. So you have your two qubits, you make a measurement here, you get an outcome. Depending on what you get here, you have to correct the errors on this guy to get the right output state. Um, that's very nice that you can really control um, alpha in such a way that you can have arbitrary rotations, which allows you to really address all points on the Bloch sphere, which is needed as shown before yesterday for for basically universal quantum computing. Um, and this one also, as I mentioned, is important byproduct for, for um, slowing down. And this actually requires classical communication in the quantum computer, which is different to the circuit model, where, of course, you can just drive it as you designed the, the gates, the one qubit and two qubit gates. Good. Um, let's take a case of three qubits, and after that, I hope for, I'm sure you understand the basic idea of, comp of these computations. Such a circuit, and that's the answer uh, in the beginning, such a circuit allows you to make a set and an X rotation. So you could ask, how can it be that you can move to an X rotation? As I've just shown before, you rotate around the set axis. Um, and it goes the following way. You start, as usual, with your, wait a second, with your, with your, with your circuit, which means a measurement here um, takes you to this kind of situation that the input here that you have is teleported basically over there. Teleportion, teleportation goes as shown before. The angle alpha here, the measurement basis, defines how you rotate your input state, which was encoded there, followed by the Hadamard, and depending if you had an error or not, zero, one outcome here in the given basis, you know your target state there. So now you could measure this psi 1, okay? Basically to continue your computation. If you measure this guy, of course you destroy the entanglement also to that neighbor, and you map it to this output state. And now the output state here is defined as what happens here and there. So basically, you take your input state encoded from here. The first measurement on the first guy was this, this rotation alpha, Hadamard, and then the Pauli error here. And then again, you have the same happening on this qubit, where you have a rotation on the uh, no, different angle, let's call it beta, beta, where you have a Hadamard followed, and then again, this kind of Pauli error. But you see there's some minus one here written down, which is to the power of error happened or no error happened, zero, one. This is because you can rephrase um, such, a, such a formalism that you basically throw this Pauli error to the back. That has a meaning, because otherwise, keep in mind, if you have an error happening, you would have correct or would need correct before you do anything else here at this stage, which is annoying. So we would like to throw all these Pauli errors to the end and they propagate through the circuit because it has these nice um, C phase gates which allow you to, to, to propagate those, those Pauli corrections to the end. However, they change their properties. So sometimes an X becomes an Z and so on according to what you learn in, 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 the, in the courses. So basically what you see here is that when you throw these X errors on the other side, you get a minus beta here as rotation, which allows you to rewrite this kind of equation that you have now. The first rotation, alpha Hadamard, and dependent if you get a zero or one outcome here, you apply beta or minus beta rotations, such that at the very end to the last qubit, you apply your Pauli corrections in a very simple way. Okay, So you can collect all the Paulis to the, to the end. Sometimes they basically erase each other. That's maybe nice. But really, you just need to adapt the next measurement setting here on that qubit. And of course, um, if, you, if you see, you have basically the sandwich structure. 
You have a Hadamard from that side. It comes your set rotation, and here's a Hadamard. And if you write it down like this, then you realize that's the same as an X rotation. Hadamard set X, Hadamard set Hadamard is the same as an X rotation. Therefore, you can really rewrite this kind of lines as set rotation on the first guy, followed by an X rotation on this guy, dependent of plus or minus beta angle, if there was a zero and one outcome, followed by this Pauli correction at the end. You see, the X became here a Z at the end because it has to propagate through um, this, this Hadamard here, which makes it um, to a Z. Okay, if you go to more complicated structures, the story stays the same. So you have your inputs encoded here. You start your measurements, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, because the end is the output here. And then you um, get the output. And then it's the same story that you have no rotations on this qubit amount alpha, here rotation amount beta. Again, you choose this by the measurement basis. Um, and then what's nice, you have hardwired here, okay, when you make the next measurements, a gamma and delta on these guys, you have hardwired this C, C phase gate between this or among those qubits, which you get for free. Keep in mind, if you build circuits, that's the expensive part, okay? So those two qubit gates is the thing that people bite their teeth out to get this established, and here it's already pre existing. However, somebody else had to do the job to prepare such a cluster state at the first point, but in principle, once you have it, you say, okay, cheap job. I just need to measure and I can do whatever I like to do. Uh, and same story as before, these errors can also be propagated to the end. That you see it by, by that's just some mathematics, you see this with this um, C phase gate, how they, how they flip around the errors to the very end. But that's not the point here. Okay, so again in cartoons, the story is very simple. Every measurement basically does this kind of rotation set axis, followed by the Hadamard. And therefore, we can choose your basis. For example, it can be zero. It would be this basis. An outcome plus or minus would correspond to zero plus one or zero minus one if alpha equals zero uh, or any other alpha. If you choose alpha pi by two or three pi by two, it's left or right circular for photons as basis. You can implement the rotations. So you measure. So you get zero, one outcome. One makes you unhappy because you have to apply some correction. Correction means you choose m minus beta instead of beta. And then, of course, you continue your computation until you get your output state there. It's just the slides before and one slide summarized that you basically um, see basically what's, what's happening there. Good. Something that's um, not related to the quantum computational, quantum computational courses, but still fascinates me from how much um, this kind of one-way quantum computation model changed the mind of, of how computers work. Okay? So when I talk to computer scientists, it seemed really that, um, I'm not exaggerating, it's really like what the people tell me. It made some kind of paradigm shift, uh, how information processing works, okay? And the thing that um, philosophers mentioned to that kind of computation is, and I really recommend to read it, is this kind of library of Babel. Do you know this kind of book? Unfortunately, it's Argentinian authors, it's, it's, um, it's Borges. Of course, we don't read Argentinian stuff here. These authors don't count in Brazil. But that's an amazing book. He says, he, there's, there's, a, there's this library which is basically a fantasy construction it's made of these hexagonal rooms and he says there's a library existing of all possible books that can exist every typo, every word, everything in there exists, okay? If you put in the numbers out of um, so 25 characters and so on and all the possible errors existing you have basically an infinite basis set of... sorry, it's a little bit... I get fixed here before I can continue with my library. Okay. Obrigado. Um, but the story is here. You have basically an, uh, everything that's, that's existing out there, every book that has been written, will be written, is existing in that, okay? The challenge is to find the right book, okay? So people believe it's a fantasy story, which is, well, people think everything is just garbage, there's nothing found. Other people say you have to find the right persons that guide you to the book who is properly written and so on. But the thing that's related here to this one-way model is it's somewhat the same, okay? So the cluster state can be seen as you have all possible answers pre-existing, okay? And you get the right answer by asking the right question step by step. And remarkably, that's as hard as starting from scratch to build a circuit model, circuit by circuit. 
So that's related to the story here in the library. It means it's as hard to write a book from scratch, okay, whatever, like the, the biggest romance, uh, Goethe, whatever, if you mind. It's as hard to write the book yourself than to find the book who is in there that has no typos and is basically the precise copy of that. So this paradigm shift of, 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 of producing the result by circuits and having pre-existing all answers and you get the wrong by asking questions, you know, at the end you ask questions, the measurement is just a question, are you on that basis zero, one, yes or no, no. Are you on that basis zero, none, yes or no. Basically you, you ask questions and you get the right result, it's precisely the same effort as starting from scratch to build it from circuits. And that's related to this book where people, I was fascinated by this concept that it's somehow also happening there, okay? That's one, one interesting thing for me from a philosophy touch, but there are also pragmatic reasons why measurement-based computing um, was interesting for, for applications. Okay, so I recommend at least check the Wikipedia page where I also find a short summary. Uh, why it's interesting. Because this book actually stimulated philosophers about why God can never be proven to be existing, similar arguments, because it's a it's, it's very, very, very strong book. It's not thick, but I've, I've not read it. read it, just read some summary about 10 pages, but it's really, I would like to read it at some point. It's like, uh, it seems to be interesting. Okay, photons. So as you've seen, measurement is intrinsic happening in measurement-based quantum computing. Okay, clear, the name tells you that. But that's nice for photons. As you see here, quantum computing requires nonlinear gates, okay, to make them. Um, photonic gates, in, if you don't have Kerr or other nonlinearities, require measurements to basically make gates happening. Okay? And then you can say, wait a second, maybe that, that's not bad because this can somehow combine with this kind of one-way quantum computing model where you anyways have to do measurements to destroy it. Okay? So with some luck, photons seem to be really suited for this kind of concept. And it turns out, yes, so far most experiments have been done with photons uh, with this cluster business. So what you can do is to generate cluster states is, as you've seen yesterday's, um, you can take a resource basically from, and you could take four photons and then entangle each of them, or you say, no, I'm cheap. I start with an entangled state from here, and this could be already a cluster state. You just apply some local operations to look like a two-qubit cluster state. Here's a two-qubit cluster state, and then you just make a C-phase gate, as we have shown yesterday by at the end. And here it's not bad that you destroy afterwards because this cluster state existing of one, two, three, four modes here anyways would need to be measured to process your information. So at the end it's, it seems to be very nice to regular photonic systems um, for this scheme. Um, that's basic mathematics so you can start with these phi states and if you apply the right, the right entangling operation and you get a cluster state, sorry, a cluster state looking like that, uh, which is a cluster state but just, just on different bases we have one minus sign here of, of the four terms. Good. Um, so, talking about cluster states, we have done that oh, during a PhD happening um, many years ago. Um, unfortunately, I did not have such a, such, such a machine where we just needed one gate there. And the reason is there was already pre-existing some other arrangement, arrangement and being very lazy at that time and having in mind to be faster than maybe some other competitors, uh, I used the, the old existing apparatus and I'll show in a second what's the trade-off for that. And um, at that point people smiled and the group said, well, actually that's, that's what's happening there. If you don't get what you like, like what you get. So if you don't have the right apparatus, then like what you have, have, have sitting there and make the best out of it. Um, so again, it's something that you've seen yesterday for this controlled knot gate, where we have two polarizing beam splitters here and there. And we need four photons for four qubit cluster states. So the down conversion source, and we pump back and forth with a laser. And we get pa pairs in forward emission, pairs in backward emission. Then if you superimpose them at the beam splitter, and there was some tricky part to align the phases properly to get such a cluster state. So in, in, that's the picture of the cluster state machine that was there. And you see this is polarizing beam splitter one and two. Here's the, the paths of one pair, other pair, other, so sorry, first pair second pair, they meet here at the beam split, and then with properly alignment, we get the cluster state. Uh, some more details of so what happened there. So we prepared to have two different pairs emitted in forward and backward direction, so the laser comes, dum dum. And then we had, um, we prepared these phi states, and you remember, a PBS is a parity check, that polarization from here and there needs to be the same to give you a click here and there. So if all of them, all of, all of our photons are, let's say, horizontally polarized, then it will propagate, split up in the right way and give you this term, makes you happy. If you have these input states, 
if them if they could be if, if they have been maybe all of them in the in the green or vertically polarized state because this term and that term meet then you get the other term makes you also happy but i've not mentioned yesterday it's as likely to get a pair here and a pair there as having two pairs from the same side which sometimes is good sometimes is bad in this case it's not a bug it was a feature so we had events where he basically get two times the pairs emitted. You see it can have then either two times, two times, so four H's, four V's, or basically combinations of both. And the combination is what you want. So if one mode has H and V and the other one as well, that's what you want because then you split up if they come from that side and you see you get now these terms which correspond to also something you need for the cluster state. And at the very end, you hope to get the same from the other side as well. We get also this kind of splitting up here which give you the missing part there. The problem, and it's just a small, small thing I want to mention here, was a big issue at that time. You don't get the right phases, so you have to be tricky to make a phase flip on one particular state, and we used some quantum interference by turning a wave plate which acts twice as much on the terms of two photons travel here, so that's in a cartoon the four terms you get, but you want to have a plus sign here, and by turning this wave plate you see this guy is affected twice as much by the wave plate than others, because quantum interference means two photons sit there, and if you misalign it in the beginning, you get the right amplitudes at the end, that you have basically um, four terms where this made a phase sign flip, and the others are still as they should be. The basic in a nutshell, that was the, the task, the challenge at that time. Okay, um, that's a picture of the, of the density matrix. That time was one of the first density matrices uh, for four qubits. It's now 10 years ago. Uh, we are pretty proud to, to get so much data. We measured for a few, few, almost two days. We got this state, which is the same as the cluster state in literature, if you apply Hadamard on the first and the last qubit. But in principle, it's the same state as you, as you would like to work with. Um, then a few years later, we, so the first generation here had no error correction. So as I've shown before, you would want to adjust alpha and then beta plus or minus. The first generation was very simple, just considered the zero outcome and has thrown away the other results. Of course, that's not deterministic because you have only one half of the outcomes that are useful for you. But um, later we did the proper job by putting delay lines. So you see, basically, you get the clusters here, one, two, three, four, the four, four cluster states or cluster qubits. And then we had delay lines which show the concept of how to make it deterministic, this computation. The first, ignore, that was not, not important, but here's the computation starts with this qubit. You measure zero or one randomly, you get an outcome. Then basically what you get here is basically feed forward to a measurement, basically a rotation plate. It's a, it's a fast switch, so-called electro-optical modulator, where when you apply voltage, you can switch your wave plate on a very fast time scale with a nanoseconds. So you have to apply this correction here, beta to minus beta setting, while the photon is still flying, because otherwise it's dead. You know, photons are very sensitive. So basically, you, res you get the output and you adjust this wave bit while this guy is in a fiber. So a fiber allows you to delay the photons. And this delay corresponds to a roughly 30 meters of fiber. So this guy is traveling here while you adjust the output there, the wave plate for, the, for preparing the new basis. You get an output here. And then again, you could... Basically, you have the last guy here where you just need to apply, depending on the outcome here and there, also just Pauli corrections, X and Z, as I've shown before. With this little circuit here and these delay lines, they go in a linear way. You can really implement a deterministic computation by having those fast switches. And switches here can be extremely fast. So nowadays, it could be maybe even 50 nanoseconds, which, which is very promising to have, in principle, one of the fastest architectures for computers uh, in terms of, of gate switches, faster than ions can do and other systems um, by, by these very fast switches here and delay lines, okay? Good, the four qubit cluster was the first prototype and it was a nice system because it's pretty rich, although it's so small. And you can see that you can do many things depending on how you start to measure. So you prepare this cluster here and then you, then you know, okay, if you measure from left to right, it's just a one qubit rotation. This qubit is rotated to here and here and here. But if you start to measure from the center, you basically get this kind of cluster because you can rewrite it as a horseshoe where here's the input, one and two, and then you process in a two-dimensional way. And you see it defined by the structure. You start with a C phase as well in the beginning. Or if you start here, you get this reverse horseshoe cluster, which is a different circuit because first you rotate, and then at the last step, you have the C phase getting a pretty nice, very 
very, very nice system. And the other thing which is a nice feature of cluster states, when you apply swap operations, which is easy for photons. By the way, that's the reason why match gates and swap, swap operations, they also have a universal computation. It's a nice concept for photons because swap is so easy. You just replace the fibers or just re relabel your detectors. If you apply swap here, which is called local complementation, you get this kind of structure effectively, which means you actually have two C phases here and, and I'll have different access to different gates. So um, that was done. So basically all the things uh, have been shown in, in the first experiments. If you have this cluster, you could implement those rotations. Uh, such a cluster, you see this kind of circuit, phase gate and rotations. The horse, other horseshoe is the first rotation, then the phase gate and so on. That's the box cluster. We have two C phases and in the middle there are rotations. And this, these are the first results at that time where you can have shown you rotate to different points. Ideally, in real life, they're not uh, pure, the states at the end, because there's some noise uh, from, the, from the machine, but still you get good approximation, a good agreement with what you expected to get here. This is the outcome of the, of the two qubit gates, not so important, but there was uh, plenty of stuff that could be shown that time. And that's a picture, a fancy picture of the setup. Here's the down conversion crystal, here's the two PBSs where you basically get a cluster state was generated uh, in the setup. Um, a nice thing that uh, could be done if the 4-qubit cluster was to show that there's always a Grover search possible. Uh, I guess many of you are familiar with the Grover search algorithm, which means if you have an unsorted database, you can uh, have a quadratic speed up in finding the right result. So if you live in Vienna, for example, we have 2 million people, uh, classically you have to ask, and let's say somebody gives you a phone number, you go out to the party, if you find the dream girl, you get the phone number, but you forget her name. Yeah, that's an unsorted database, no? because normally you sort by name in telephone books. <laughs> the numbers are not sorted by, uh, by, 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 the, by, the, by the order. So if you have the phone number, you have to ask typically one million times the telephone book, is this the right number? However, if you have global search, you have a quadratic speed up. So basically instead of one million, you have the square root of that, which is roughly 1,000 steps or asks or queries that you have to do to get the phone number of your dream girl that you've lost at the party. Okay. Um, without going into too much details, the idea of Grover search is um, rather simple. You have input states and then something that's the magic thing, some black box, some oracle, tags what you're looking for. For example, you look for the red book or the red arrows, you tag it, you don't know which was tagged but somebody else does it for you, and you apply phase shift to this uh, input state. Uh, graphically shown, you basically make a flip because you get a minus phase to this guy, as shown here. And now what you do is, as a search algorithm, you basically you make an inversion about the mean value. So you generate the mean value where everybody's flipped around that, but since this guy was in a different, has a different phase, it shows up that he grows out of the results, which means the other ones are knocked down all the time by reversing back and forth about the mean value, while this guy gets enhanced and you get this one as the right answer. If you ask um, a few times, basically this speed up comes from this kind of how often you have to apply this operation. Um, this was done with four qubits. There you see very nicely what I mean if this inversion about the mean. Four qubits allow, sorry, four qubits is, is computer, but two qubits are the input. These are the computational bases. So basically two qubits give you zero, 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 one, and so on. If you take this guy, and taking means the black box applies a phase by making me measurements here and there, as shown here in the circuit. Then you make a phase shift. Basically, what you do is you entangle to one of the four belt states. That's what happens if you make a phase shift of minus pi to one of those, those guys. So if you now make inversion about the mean value, what happens is the mean value here is one half. It's basically this line because it's to, to the mathematics. One, two, three, and this has a minus one, so it's minus one is two divided by four elements is one half, so that's this line. And if you invert about the mean, it means this area is flipped down around this point. So this one goes to zero. This one goes to zero, this one goes up, and this one goes to zero again. So by basically applying once this inversion about the mean value, you get only this guy's answer. So to make the story short, if you tag it, you have to ask only once which of the four books was tagged as error here. That's the this global search algorithm in a nutshell. These are the results that you had basically 90% achievement with tagging one of the four books and so on in there. Okay, um, since... Uh, one of the fathers of this algorithm is here, Deutsch Chose algorithm was implemented as, as well. Um, um, I guess you're also familiar with that, so you can ask 
basically you can have an exponential speed up to figure out if a function is constant or balanced. Um, constant means it always gives out the same output independent of the input state. So function is always zero independent if uh, x is zero one, or it's always one if independent if x here is zero and one. So it's a pretty boring situation. And balanced means it's basically it, the output is dependent on the input, which is like either flipped, so basically zero zero one one, or flipped zero one one zero. Graphically speaking, you can ask if a coin is basically fair. It means it's properly made. Or it's basically like a, a, a fake coin where both say sides have the same same symbol. Um, quantum mechanics basically gives you speed up that you instead of asking twice front and back how do you look like, you can ask only once or even exponential speed up if you go to more bigger systems uh, by by applying this algorithm. It's a very nice normally it's the archetype algorithm people show because there you see nicely the concept of superposition, um, uh, entanglement, face kick back and read out uh, interference face kickback of algorithm. To keep it short, such a cluster state allows to implement this deutsch josa algorithm where uh, the challenge is to implement the four functions, the two, the two constant ones and the two balanced ones, and you implement it by choosing the measurement setting here. Um, the deutsch josa basically is phrased by control and target here. Then you apply these functions, and at the end you would like to, ask, to figure out by asking only once which of this class, this class or that class was implemented and that's shown here, basically, the input states, plus and minus, change to the, the, the first, the control bit, changes to 0 plus 1 or 0 minus 1, depending if the function is constant or balanced. And by asking only once, you get the answer. And that's just a nutshell. It was, was also done with this kind of cluster state computers. And it's the balanced answer in the experiment. OK, as time is rushing through, I would like to change gears. So the thing that actually more fascinated than measurement-based computers is this kind of blind quantum computers, which um, really spinned off this paradigm shift of measurement-based computing. The paradigm shift, um, I'll show in a second, I see the other slide comes first, uh, allows to address a super important question which every one of you actually is facing every day. So until these days, there is no secure cloud computing. So everything that you do when you talk to Gmail, Yahoo, Facebook bank account, the only thing that's secure is the communication to the computer there. But then to process your input, your credit card number, it must be decrypted and you have plain text, okay? So what people have there, everything that you would like to keep secret must be plain text if it should be used for the computer for some useful thing. So bank accounts are transparent for the banks. The Facebook owner has everything that you have, pictures, text messages, a plain text, and there's no way to keep them secret, okay? Um, and you see these days with internet, um, uh, debates between North America, United States, everything that runs over servers there can be screened because it must be plain text. What cryptography does, so quantum cryptography is just the communication channel can be secured, okay, with a quantum enhancement, but not the processing until recently. So one of the fathers of this classical RSA code, which is used nowadays as this SSH shell for whatever, telnet, uh, internet and so, asked the question, can we actually process this encrypted data and it was believed for more than 30 years, no, the complexity class arguments, because you scramble up the results and so on. And um, they were basically in 2009, there were basically two solutions coming up. One is like a classical solution, which gives you, um, oops, it's the wrong slide, so I have to, okay, I have to use my, my words then, because I, I chose something different here. So there are two solutions coming up. One, a classical answer, which gives you um, a classical, um, it allows a classical framework of, of, of computational security. We assume you don't have supercomputers or quantum computers at hand. That's the Gentry protocol. The IBM guys who basically now disappeared for government research. And then at the same time came this uh, quantum answer from uh, Joe Fitzsimmons, Alan Kashefi, and, and Broadband, who have shown you can use this measurement-based computing scheme to get quantum-enhanced security for a computer such that in addition to the speed up we all be aware of, you can achieve a cloud computation where one of the clients, or basically many clients, dependent, depends how you like to deal with it, um, just basically just need a limited of quantum nest, lim simple quantum resources to delegate computation in such a way that the computer does not know the input, the processing and output, so it's blind. Okay? And that's the reason that people call it blind quantum computation. So the uh, easiest case is, of course, you have one client, and there's this beast, and that's the, the office who made this, I think, really pioneering work, showing that you can really establish security as a new feature for quantum computers 
Um, um, and which, which of course is nowadays of very high important interest when, when you see what's happening in the news. So how can it be that this, this scheme allows you to be secure? And actually you have all the knowledge right now why this can be done. So the point is that this kind of scheme allows to split the quantum part and the classical part of the computation. So guys, question, what's classical and what's quantum? Precisely. So let's start quantum first. Quantum is the pre-existing resource entanglement, okay? But the classical information is here the structure, because we know if it's like this, it must be one qubit gate. It can only be one line, no? If it's like a horseshoe, for example, you know there must be two input qubits and so on. So the structure intrinsically tells you what kind of a computation you have in mind. And the measurement angle, of course. By choosing the angle, you define what kind of rotation you implement. So if you hide those two classical points, okay, you can really hide what's happening in the computation. And that's again, paradigm shift of how data is processed. It allows you to be extracted from this very nice computation model. You can split those two resources um, and of course, which later on led to, led to this very nice concept of we can hide what's happening by that. Um, so I put slides together, so basically it's a wrap up of what I mentioned before, clustered computation, reminder, you qubits, you entangle them, the qubits are in this kind of beginning point of zero plus one, you entangle the C phase, you make the measurement in this basis here, defined by this, now it's delta, but it's the same story, and this delta makes a rotation plus guy rotated by this amount to the neighborhood. Again, structure must be hidden, measurement angle must be hidden. So how to hide the, the structure? It's pretty simple. It says, well, let's define a generic structure which can implement everything that you need for universal quantum computing. So if you remember, you need arbitrary one qubit gates and two qubit gates. So if you choose this 10 qubit system here, and you can say that's my brick, okay? And by choosing the right angle for each of the qubits within the bricks, you see there's 10 qubits. You can implement a Hadamard, for example, or you can implement a pi over 8 gate, which we have seen yesterday is important to basically reach every point on the, on, the, on the Bloch sphere. You can do a density by just doing boring measurements, or you can implement a C naught. So in other words, if I give you this brick structure of 10 qubits, you can put them together, like shown here, put them together. I can take a snapshot and have no idea what's going to happen because the measurements will define how each brick converts to what kind of operation unit. Um, so that's pretty easy to understand how you can hide the structure by that. What's the trade-off? Well, you need slightly more qubits than in the ideal case because each brick has at least 10 qubits, basically to define it, um, to allow it to be um, everything you would like to have the brick for you working for. Um, good, we've done this with four qubits, but we have seen, we've said it's basically half a brick, so it's good enough, but um, that's the link to the experiment. So now we have to hide, and it's a little bit more challenging now. And that was the question of, my, of this lecture. So now we have to hide the measurement basis, the, the measurement that does, that's done by the computer. Okay? And that's a little bit more tricky. So what's, what's needed now is that um, you start with qubits. Again, the same story of cluster computation, but now you, you add a phase also to the first qubits before you start to entangle them. So the story is the following. You take qubits now where each of the qubits gets a random phase, and the phase must be, it's sufficient to be one of eight different settings on the xy plane. So basically zero plus one, zero plus i something, zero minus one, and so on. But each qubit is a different phase, and that's important. Now you prepare the qubits, and you send the qubits one by one to the computer who has the power to entangle. Remember, the hard thing is to make cluster state. So the machine there has the power to make this big resource state, but by the no-cloning theory, he cannot look how each qubit looks like, okay? He cannot read out the face. If he tries to measure, he destroys it. Or if he tries to measure and he says, okay, I destroy it no matter what, he still is, cannot recover the face that's existing there, like the, like the quantum cryptography principle. So therefore, he gets those qubits, he entangles them, but he doesn't know which classes that he obtains. It's the same like you, you make a bell state, but you don't know which bell state, phi plus, phi minus, or some other weird rotated guy, okay? So when you do know the measurements, the computer, again, is the guy who makes the measurements. He chooses a basis that you tell him. But the point now is, and that's the, that's the key of being secret, the point is to understand how the, how the, how the rotation works like is to keep, have to keep in mind each qubit here had not zero plus one, but an additional phase to that. So to know what's happening, you have to know the pre-existing phase of the qubit 
plus the measurement angle. So both parameters are needed to know what's happening on the qubit. And again, keep in mind, you need to know what you implement here to know how the brick as the first step will look like, okay? So brick and that together makes it basically um, blind to the machine. So the only person who knows the parameters is you as the client because you prepared the qubits. That's the only capability that you need to have. You prepare qubits, which is rather simple, for example, one photon states. You send them to the computer and you know for each of the qubits the phase you've chosen randomly. And you know then, okay, if the computer measures, you know your phase and the computer's measurement basis to know what effectively happened there. The computer only knows this one and therefore has no idea what's happening with his bricks. Okay? So this extra phase information is the point to make it, make it secure. And that's um, the protocol which looks like many mathematical pages uh, of computer scientists' papers. That's how we experimentalists like to draw it in one slide. The client has the capability to make those phases on the qubits, which he keeps secret. He sends them to the computer who entangles. And he, has to, he tells to the computer which measurement he has to perform, which actual rotation. And he knows that, um, <coughs> that this measurement that the computer does effectively uh, exists of the pre-existing phase, the rotation he wants to do, and then you have to add also some kind of um, random bit flip. So you have to define sometimes a zero and one outcome differently that within the error correction you cannot read out um, if there was an error happening or not. That's just details, but that's also important for the computation. Computer makes the measurements. For, them, for, him, for him, her, it makes no sense. Only you as the client can use the results for your computation. And that's the idea of being blind in this, in this scheme. So that's how it goes. The client prepares qubits. There's the big machine you can entangle. He does the job for you and he gives you answers that make no sense to the comp computer itself, but only sense to you. And that's basically the protocol in words. Um, Alice prepares qubits. Alice sends them to Bob, who has this uh, need a quantum channel, of course, who makes these cluster states. Bob has the power to entangle and to basically make the measurements. And Alice tells, of course, also in a classical channel, how the measurement angles should look like. And after the measurements here, Bob sends the classical outcome back, which makes really no sense to him. Um, so switching through the experimental part um, rather quickly, we've done this with four qubits. Um, being um, lazy in the sense of you want to optimize your efforts and resources, we only uh, made two qubits blind. It was sufficient to show all the features, uh, basically the same setup where uh, optical plates here and there are allowed to implement these this phases here on the client side. So the client is one, two, three, four qubits come from the client. And the computer, the service, just these beam splitters here, sorry, which make this cluster state. But it showed basically all the features. So if you have, for example, this cluster state and these are blind, then you, of course, hide the entire rotation. Um, if you have this kind of structures and these two are blind, then, of course, you hide the entire operation on that guy's. So it was really nice to show all the features, even though just two uh, were hidden, not four. And with that, we could show basically all one qubit, all two qubit gates, a blind Grover, a blind Deutsch chose, and so on. A nice thing to learn from the referee reports, and that's something I never get to tell. So sometimes you get asked, why the heck you care to do the experiment if the theory is so nice, okay? That's, that these questions are raised since Bell, Bell theorems, okay? If theory tells you it's, you're fine, why the heck you worth to spend time and effort to do it? And the answer is that um, by doing the experiments under the real-life conditions, even, even we and the theoreticians who have been on board of the paper learn something new. So the two things are it's less demanding because sometimes it's efficient not to make all of the qubits blind. So you don't need to apply all of the qubits with a phase to hide the computation, which is a nice effort for experimentalists to, to basically optimize resources because we are, you, know, it, you fight for everything that makes it simpler. And the other thing is, it's more secure than we had in mind. So more secure means even though the computer is not perfect, okay, you have noises, you have low fidelities, there's no way to extract what kind of computation you had in mind to do as long as you choose perfectly randomly the eight settings for your qubits. Okay? So more secure in a sense, even this might be a crappy machinery, okay? there's no way to extract what's happening there. And that was not obvious to the theoreticians just by putting the real numbers from the experiment and having very good referee reports and, and questions, uh, it was obvious that it's really a nice feature uh, of this computation to be so secure. 
And maybe in the future, you know, the quantum computers might be hard. Maybe there might be only a few existing to at super duper laboratories, or super secret governments, or cross sections, or Brazilian versus Argentina computing, whatever. That you would like to keep it secret or delegate, and therefore it could be you could imagine you have quantum channels that allow to delegate such computers uh, um, at over distance. So again, one leads to the other. So measurement-based measurement -based computing led to this paradigm shift of separating quantum and classical part, which allowed to develop this security for computers, quantum computers. The other thing that spinned out of that is something that's really at the heart of computer scientists, and that's um, verification, where you would like to have a tool or a method to control a quantum computer. So I guess you all have, or most of you have read the book Hitchhiker's Ride Through the Galaxy, where the answer is 42. It could be the same for quantum computer. Imagine you have a super machinery who's going beyond all classical capabilities, and you get an answer, that's the ground state, or that's, that's, that's the number, um, which is otherwise hard to verify. Okay? So how, how can you know that 42 is the right number you're looking for? And therefore, you say we'd like to have, for some kind of systems, uh, a verification toolbox to, to, to be sure, yes, the machine worked properly. And in the beginning, like the beginning is just 10 years ago, people had in mind the only way to compare results is to build different quantum computers using different technologies, superconductors versus ions versus photons. If they agree, then you probably you have the right, then you have, then you, then, then you be pretty much sure that it's the right result. But that's not what people have in mind to, to verify it because they won't have mathematical proofs and so on. So what, what's happening here is, um, and yesterday we had this, and Esto, I think, showed this, this, this nice diagram with the zoo of hierarchies. The challenge is, if you be a classical machine, which is roughly this BPP, bounded error polynomial, polynomial problems, if you be here, how can you check that this beast, this quantum bounded error quantum polynomial problems, is doing the job properly? Or well, taking this slide from Elam Kashefi, being more like in the church style, if you be human, how can you be sure that God is doing the job properly? Okay? You want to verify the business. And therefore, you have this kind of verification uh, issues and investigations from the computer scientist part. This goes hand in hand with um, the Turing questions, where I guess you're all familiar with this Turing idea. The question is, also along this verification of computers, can you ask a device and verify that's a computer, a human being? Okay. So right now, that's happening just a few months ago. The best computer, the highest level, can mimic a five-year-old. Okay. Everything who is more developed than a five-year-old. Um, basically, would basically make a difference to computer machine these days. There's an interesting question: Can we distinguish those those features? These kind of interactions, because th the way how it's done is called interactive proofs. You interact with the machine, you get an answer back. You interact again, you get an answer back. And by that, you you want to be confirmed: yes, human, no computer. You do the same for quantum computers, in the sense that you ask questions to to, to the machine: ask, are you a quantum computer or not? Do you do the job properly or not? Is the result correct or not? And that's very related to this quantum Turing concepts. So the, the challenge, of course, is to figure out what's the smallest resource you need. So until recently, it was thought you also need a small quantum computer to test another quantum computer, which is not very satisfying, because you would like to get out of this quantum business. Um, otherwise, you might run into the same errors, the same conceptual problems by asking these questions. So the question is, do we need quantumness as control mechanism here to interact with a machine? And basically, what's the, what's the smallest resource that we need in our hands to verify such a machinery? And it seems nowadays that at the end of the day, you still need some kind of quantumness in your hands to, to verify the quantum computers to doing the job properly. It seems like there's really intrinsically somewhere, somewhere wired there. But, um, uh, that, I want to show you this first. But let's show this. But there's, a, there's still a $25 question out there from, from, from famous people from the computer scientists like Scottesman, Vasilian, and Aronson, who raised this, Aronson raised this $25 challenge. Is there a way, and I mentioned a second what I mean, is there a way that you can have classical resources? This means like, can you have a, a verifier BPP in a classical world, classical resources that verifies a quantum computer, BQP, um, in an interactive way? So what's meant by here? So the language that people choose is verifier and prover. Prover is the quantum computer. He proves to you he's doing the job properly. And you're the verifier. The verifier is yes, I agree. Really, really happening correctly. So the challenge is what's the minimum effort to, 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 to be verified this done happening done properly? What's the minimum amount of X resources you need to exchange? Okay? And of course, the, as a proof, we would like to have the exponentially small chance 
to be wrong, that to, to, to really be confirmed, yes, it's happening properly there. Um, so in the language of verify and prover, there are currently um, a few investigations, a few interesting uh, works. Right now, there are basically two, in my house, two milestones, um, papers, achievements, who say, yes, you can have very little resources in your hand to verify a quantum computer. One is, was published recently in Nature, where you require entanglement between two computers, and then by having communication to each of them, with a huge overhead of many entangled pairs, you can verify, yes, it's really happening properly, this beast. The other scheme is this one here, which I like actually more. Um, it's related to blind quantum computing, where you have a classical, almost classical verifier who prepares qubits, and I'll show in a second. And you can interact with this client or verifier to the quantum computer who proves you as a prover that the results are done properly. Um, and that's basically the, the, the comic to that. So you send your qubits, and now the point is, without mathematics, the point is now some of the qubits are traps. So you as client or as verifier prepare them in a given state where you know the eigenstate of them. So even though the computer entangles them and processes the qubits, you, you know the result for some of the qubits that you prepare as trap. So the point is, you ask this, for example, qubit 22, I prepared qubit 22, is this the state x1? And the answer must be x1, otherwise something happened wrongly there, okay? So placing many traps randomly where you, where you know the result for the measurement outcome there, you can confirm, you can prove that it basically <coughs> allows to verify that the machinery works properly and there's really mathematical proof behind it. So that's basically shown in the comic. That's the trap. This is that the other ones which are just used in a regular way and you get results back. And this result here, based on the measurement angle you told him to do, you expect the one. If you don't expect the one, if for example, you say something is wrong, something's happening wrong in the machinery there. So we placed those traps at, at, in random positions and we got, well, high agreement with respect to what we achieved in laboratories, but that's the idea you expect. For example, this number, we got the 90%, 95% fidelities, agreement, and we could really show in a, in a, in a, in a first example that, that the idea really works in a small computation. Um, more like fundamental interest, we could also make the blind belt test in the sense that the computer performs a bell violation without knowing there's a bell violation happening, so you can also verify, yes, there must be entanglement in the system because you couldn't fake them otherwise um, by, by, by measurements. Um, the last few minutes is like um, something that's, that's spinning off very recently. So you've seen this, this kind of security is a big issue. Many groups try to figure out, can we improve the schemes? Can we, can we make it simpler? And, and is there anything that can be done to make it even, even more accessible to, to realistic uh, computations? And one thing that's happened recently is like, um, yes, you can make it even, even much simpler, where, where you can question, is this really a delegated computation when you change the game so the computation work? So the simplest way to make a secure, just understand a second what I mean by that. The simplest way to make a secure computation is by making cluster states regularly, okay? No faces, no brickworks, nothing like this. You make them regularly, and then you know you make the measurements to, to drive your computation. But the point is, the computer makes the cluster state and it's not allowed to measure. <laughs> it sends just qubit one by one to you as the client and you just need the capability to measure them as you would like to, okay? So you could say that similar to the other case where you need the capability to prepare one qubit, you send this to the computer who entangles, makes measurements and then gives the answers back. It's the same from the technological point of view as just getting qubits and you make a measurement by yourself and you say, okay, that's my outcome, I know the result. However, it's debated in the community that this is really a delegation because it means like I give you the computer basically and do whatever you like to do. So it's, it's like a question about, about, about flavors. However, I like the idea. So we have done some, some experiment. The, the reason why this is also secure is because when you make measurements here, um, you cannot, same, same arguments, you prepare a state here, but you cannot read it out because there are no cloning principle. You cannot read out the new psi there because you would need to do more measurements uh, on one qubit, but you can only do one measurement. Um, and you can have a very simple Alice, which is just required to make measurements and some detectors. So it, it's, it's very handy in terms of experimental apparatus, apparatus. So again, the same machine as shown before. That's the cluster state machine. You prepare your four qubits here, but now the storage you're not allowed to measure. This computer side, it sends the photons now to the other side here. Alice who performs measurements. So Bob is here and Bob prepared those 
cluster states you had in mind, you made those linear cluster states, you made those three cluster states for making some kind of CNOT gates. But the point is, everything is done for the computation on the LS side for making the measurements. And therefore, you can say it's also secure in the sense that um, the computer had no idea what's happening there. Um, the last slides, then we are done. So, um, yes, as I mentioned, this kind of tree cluster here allows to run the C naught. We had this guy to control. Here's the target. We've shown before how this works with the measurement settings and, and propagation information. We get, um, for example, this is input. This would be the output. Like you entangle these two states to this kind of rotated belt state. And these are typical fidelities we get in laboratories with um, four photons these days. You can also apply verification concepts. If you send some qubits there, you make measurements that prepare the other guys over there by the entanglement. If they, if they agree, for example, two and four, then you know he makes the right cluster states. If they do not agree, then you know something's happening in the machinery by, by some whatever fault or bad, bad issues and so on. So you can also apply the, basically the same verification concepts with such a computer as if the, if the other scheme is shown before. Good, with that, I reached the end. So that was my, my approach to measurement-based schemes from more or less uh, applied side as a, as a photony, as a photon guy. And I guess Ernesto will probably cover much more, much nicer the theory behind that for how those things can be mapped to circuit models back and forth, because it's really beautiful mathematics, beautiful physics behind those measurement quantum computing schemes. And really very rich, you can spin off in many directions. Um, and it's still a very open field. We encourage you guys to take at least a look in these directions because it's, it's really beautiful physics behind those, those computational models. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Philip, for the great talk. And um, do you have questions? Yes. How's the dark count, sorry? The, so four photon events, at the end we count the four photon coincidences still, there are no dark counts. Yes, yes. Because at, at the end it's also like a, a net to, to improve the quality because you know the given arrival time. So at the end it's just like shifted by those delay lines, but it's still a coincidence in the sense of X, then t T1, T2, T3, T4, all if those events happen in the right timing, then you know it must, must have been the right event. Otherwise, you would see the singles like, so it's the same. Ernesto? Yes. 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 Wait two months, then you see it hopefully in the paper. Yes, so it's very nice. So different, uh, there's different people working on that. We have something with Joe Fitzsimmons in Singapore. So yes, there's a way to very nicely actually to get classic computers and you and you just put a little bit of quantumness in there to have no speed up, but to make them secure. Um, and it's it's again to be secure. So in, in a nutshell, without too many details, the the price for security is there's still some probabilistic feature in the computation, but you can drive it deterministically by having classical error correction and so on. But at the end, the framework works, and I think it's the biggest feature of this kind of spin-off that at the end of the day, we have probably classical computers around, and if some little bit of quantum channels, which is not crazy, like cryptography um, technology levels, you can make really delegated computation secure. Yes, of course, of course. Yes, we, we, we have not done this, but other groups did that. You can have a path and angular momentum, so people encoded up to three degrees of freedom per photon. It's totally the same. So it's really like, yes. Uh, at some point, we will switch to that. So right now, we're focusing on polarization, but I hope that at some point, when we have more photons, six and eight, it would be nice to go to 20 qubits by having polarization and path together, which is not crazy. So it's actually two questions. The first is, what is the circuit model picture of this blind computing? If you translate from the measurement based model to the circuit model, you should have an equivalent thing. The second is, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna 
So yes and no, there's a mapping between the circuit model, but none of them are straightforward. So I don't know if there's a paper published yet. Um, if, if we have those questions were raised years ago from, from the referee reports as well. So I know that for the adiabatic one, there's nothing, ideas, but nothing published yet. For mapping to the circuit model, um, honestly, I don't know if there's anything published. I heard it's in principle possible, but I think it's not out yet. Ernesto, do you know? Is this, you know? Actually, I think there's a paper by Terry Rudolph where they show up on no, yes, computer. No, that's different. That. That's a paper about, so using Terry's words, I would um, doubt about the applicability. It would make a fun idea. No, that's, yeah, but it goes the direction. But Terry had something in mind. Um, but no, the, the people who, the only people who have thought about it seriously is Joe Fitzsimmons. And, and there, I think, my, my knowledge was, so we talked pretty often about that. Yes, it can be done, but it's not that, that straightforward. Even though you think you can map it easily, but the security issues put some constraints how you can do it. So I hope I answered some of your questions. I feel like shaky, but um, uh, principle yes, not published yet. That's my understanding. And I don't know how. Excuse me? Yes. Circuit model is equivalent to, to class. Sorry, I did not mention it. The measurement-based model is equivalent in terms of resources and, and anything else to the circuit model, OK? So the same gates. In principle, it's as hard to build those gate models, because you need two qubit gates, as putting them up front to make the cluster state of the right size. However, for experimentalists, so I have not emphasized this much, it's a big difference because I have just, I prefer one machine that gives me always the same cluster state and it can work for different softwares. Otherwise, you have to rebuild your computer all the time, no new to make, okay, here it's C0, tomorrow there is C0, oof, okay? So it's for, for us, it's a big, big important, a big improvement in terms of um, being feasible. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Philip again. And we reconvene in 15 minutes, unless someone has announcements. Yeah.